Uh, today we're going to go ahead and run a pre-qualified joint using a pre-qualified procedure, shield of metal arc welding or stick welding in the 3G position. We're going to use the latest version, it's the 2015 edition of the D11 code book. So let's get started. We're going to go into the pre-qualified area of the WPSs and I'm going to show you guys the joint designation. All right, so the welding process is SMAW, joint designation is BU2A, so it's a butt joint. Base metal thickness, we can do this up to unlimited. So here's one of the areas that I'll, I kind of want to point out, right? So if we have a quarter inch root opening, we should have a groove angle of 45 degrees, meaning each piece of our base material will be beveled at 22 and a half degrees. If we go up to a 3 8 root opening, it'll be at 30 degrees. So each one of these would then be 15 degree angle. Same thing for the half inch. Now up here we have our tolerances. We have as detailed tolerances that the weld engineer can go ahead and specify or whoever's writing the welding procedure. And then the as fit up when we get out to the shop and we start putting this thing together. Now as the welder, you're allowed to combine these tolerances. So if I have a quarter inch root opening and the engineer or the detailer gives me a 16th of an inch tolerance, I can have from zero up to five sixteenths. But then I can add the tolerance they give me in the shop. So I can actually drop down to three sixteenths. So I take my one sixteenth minus a quarter, that'll give me three sixteenths, up to a quarter here, this quarter here. So that gives me up to a half of an inch. And I'm allowed to have that one sixteenth compensated by the engineer or the detailer. So this weld joint can actually be between three sixteenths and nine sixteenths for my root opening. That same applies for the groove angle. So if I have a 45 degree groove angle here, the engineer or the detailer is going to give me plus, or he's going to give me a plus 10 here. Out in the shop, I can do plus 10 or minus 5. So I can actually go from 40 up to 60 degree included angle. So I can have 22 and a half to a 30 degree angle and still within be in the scope of the pre qualified. Uh, this position is allowed for all welding positions in the SMAW process. Okay, we're, we've already got our plates cleaned up and tacked, and according to AWS, they want you to re remove mill scale, oil, paints, and deposits, or anything of the nature, uh, and clean it down to bare base metal in the area where the weld's gonna be performed. So I went ahead and cleaned everything back about three quarters of an inch to an inch on both sides. As I'm welding, I don't wanna pull any contamination from the mill scale on the back side of this plate up into my, my backing strip and into my weld joint. I want to try to stack the deck in my favor. So anything that I can do that's going to better, you know, give me a better quality weld, that's what I'm going to do. It takes a little bit more effort and time, but in the long run, it's going to be worth it. All right, so let's go ahead and get this tacked up. So as far as tack placement, I'm just going to place one down here, combining the, the, these three plates, one on this side, flip the piece over, and put three tacks on the back side of each weld, roughly an inch long, spaced out evenly.
All right, so we got everything teched up, and you'll notice that I've got probably a little bit smaller of a tack here on my run in, a little bit bigger of a tack here on the runoff tab. And the reason is everybody, you know, complains about getting arc blow at the top or electromagnetic blowback, whatever you want to call it. Having that tack around here and the three tacks on each side that I have on the back is going to try to help, or it's going to eliminate or alleviate, rather some of the, uh, the arc blow that we could experience. Another thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my ground clamp, or workpiece clamp, closer to the top of the material. So a good rule of thumb is, if you have the option, uh, if you have an eighth inch diameter electrode or smaller, weld to it. Meaning, I'm gonna have my workpiece clamp at the top, I'm gonna start at the bottom, and I'm gonna weld to that clamp. If I have a 532nd welding rod or larger, I'm gonna weld away from it. So I would, at that point, I would clamp it closer to the bottom and weld away from it. Okay, uh, that's going to help alleviate, not 100% eliminate, some of that arc blow. So it's another trick of the trade that I picked up. So as I go into this, I'm going to start down here on the run-in, or the, uh, the, yeah, the run-in tab. And that's going to allow me to build up the appropriate amount of heat. I'm going to get a good flow, a good rhythm going, and kind of dial my speed in, make sure I've got a, a good uh, arc length going on before I get into my welding area. The last thing I want to do is get into the welding area and stick the electrode and then I start you know trying to break free and then I get arc strikes all over my plate or which is a, uh, a disqualification at that moment. So I'm going to start at the bottom of the run in and as I go through I'm just going to make a slight u-shaped pattern. Now this is personal preference I know some guys they go in there and they, they just weld it they don't move the rod at all other than just going straight up. Uh, some people do a little bit of a weave or a zigzag uh, this is just my personal preference. Uh, but I'm going to carry that all the way through. I'll probably do a start and stop right here in this area because I'm going to run out of electrode. Uh, I'll do the restart and then as I continue up here, I'm going to weld all the way past the runoff tab. Now I'm going to do that because I don't want any low spots. Okay, This is the end of the weldment up here. So if I terminate my welds here, chances are I'm going to have a low spot here. Okay, Now according to the D11 code book we were just looking at, the reinforcement of this weld on the top of the plate has to be flush to an eighth of an inch. So if it's anything below that, that weldment would, er would actually get disqualified during visual and I'd never even make it to a bend test. So I'm going to make sure that I run all the way past and that's going to give me a good area or a... Uh, what that's going to do is give me a good foundation for me to lay that next weld upon. So what I'm essentially doing is I'm laying all the groundwork for my next pass and I'm planning the, the next pass in my sequence ahead of time. So we're going to run off the Everlast 210 STL, running about 110 amps, 35% arc force, and about 75% hot start. So you'll notice that when I stop the arc, or stop the, the welding, I actually just flick the electrode right out of there. What that does is it's going to create a crater. Okay, now typically I don't want to end a weld with a crater, but that's going to give me a nice little divot to tie into so that when I go ahead and do my restart, those two, I'm not going to get any cold lap in between there. I'll be able to tie in really well, and I'm not going to have a lumpy spot in that tie-in. Uh, so as I, as I go to do my tie-in, I'm going to start about a quarter inch to three-eighths above the center of that crater. 
strike the electrode, come back down, and then just pick up just like I never stopped welding. Uh, you don't want to sit there and pause a lot because that's when it's going to start to roll out on you. You don't want to do that. Uh, and then I'm just going to continue like I never stopped, going all the way through, all the way up to the top, pass over this heavy tack, and then continue off to the, uh, the runoff tab. So one thing you want to make sure of when you're going through this, is this plate cannot be too clean. So that makes sure, you know, get a little pocket flashlight out, go through it with a wire brush a couple more times. Uh, just make sure you don't have anything in there. Uh, having a nice, you know, pick set to get in there and dig any slag that's trapped between the, uh, the weld and the, uh, the plate. You know, if you get a little bit of undercut, that's fine because we're going to cover all that stuff up. Uh, but make sure you get all that slag out, okay? It's not good to trap slag in there. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you can just turn it up five amps, you know, you just burn it out. No, it's not going to go anywhere. You're just going to cover it up. So go through, do a thorough cleaning, pick it out, hit it again with a wire brush, uh, and then you should be good to go for your, your next pass. All right, now for my next trick, <clears throat> I'm going to put in the, uh, the second pass. Okay, a lot of people refer to this as a hot pass on pipe and stuff like that. Uh, I'm not going to increase my ampers at all. Uh, I don't have any wagon tracks or anything to burn out. I've got a pretty good tie-in, so I'm just going to go ahead and run a pass just a little bit wider than this first pass here, and then we'll see exactly where we're at. Um, I may go to cap from there. Uh, I may have to, to you know, add some additional passes. So we'll go ahead and run this same way. I'm going to start down here at the bottom of the runoff or the run-in tab, work my way up into that welding area, fill in, get a nice consistent bead profile, keep a tight arc length. Uh, probably have to do another restart somewhere in here and then right back out the top.
All right, so now what I'm planning on doing is I'm going to run a bead right here on the left-hand side, just a stringer all the way up there. And what I'm going to try and do is stay about 1 16th below the, uh, the top of this plate. Okay, once I get done with that one, I'm going to do the same thing to the right-hand side. Uh, I'll tie that one in, cover into the uh, weld number three there, tie this pass in about 1 16th below that plate, and then I'll go ahead and, and start running my cap after that. So if you notice on this pass, I didn't have to do a start and stop. And that's because as I was going up, I didn't spread that bead out as wide as the, the previous. So, so that root bass, you know, you're tying into three different pieces of material. So I've got my backing strip and I've got the edges of both plates. So I'm burning up a lot of filler metal trying to tie those three together. Okay, now the second pass, when I went in there, I'm using up a lot of filler metal trying to tie these two plates together. Okay, so there was another start and stop in there. Well, this last pass, I increased my travel speed just a little bit because I need a narrower weld, right? Because I'm only tying into the left-hand side of this plate and the previous weld underneath. Now, like I said before, you want your light, you're laying the foundation for your next weld, okay? So I'm basically setting myself up in a good position to put my fourth weld in here. So when I go to put my fourth weld in, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna make sure I'm about 1 16th below the, uh, the top of this plate, and I'm gonna tie in to this other, the, the weld that I just put in there, roughly 50%. 50, 50 um, so with this one, with any luck, I shouldn't have to do any, any start and stops either. And then we'll go ahead from there. I'm just about flush. We'll probably go ahead and start running the cap after that. All right, so to go ahead and cap this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna aim my electrode, I'm gonna, in the position right about here to where it's, it's centered on the, uh, the edge of this material. Because I want 50% of this weld to tie into the plate and the other 50% to tie into the weld. I'm gonna do the same thing for the subsequent passes. So each pass, I'm gonna point a little bit from right to left and stack right up against the previous pass, staying on the, the center of the toe of the previous weld each time.
But what I was aiming for is 50% of this weld tied into the plate, the other 50% on the right hand side. What this is going to give me is a nice place to push that second weld into. So I'm going to stack that next weld right up against the side of that. I'm going to use the right hand toe of this weld to be the center of my next weld. Okay, that's going to make sure I'm staying in the right place. Uh, I get even coverage, I don't have any overlap, uh, and that everything ties in correctly. Okay, it's going to give me a good place of reference. All right, so I ran out of rod on that one. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, are they're, they're gonna try and race to get to the end. Don't be afraid of a start and stop, okay? Actually, you should be practicing your starts and stops because, you know, as a welder, especially if you're doing stick electrodes and stuff, you're gonna have to do starts and stops. So practice those just as much as you practice your welding. Uh, so you shouldn't be afraid to do it. So what I'm gonna do now is the same thing. I'm gonna start about a quarter inch, three eighths above where that little crater is. I'm going to strike there, just kind of drop back down to that puddle, pick up like I never stopped, and go ahead and finish that off. Okay? I've always gotten a habit of not burning my electrodes down past my numbers, so that if you're doing code work, you know, the inspector can come by later and pick up all your stubs and, and look at them and make sure you're using the appropriate electrode for that, you know, that welding procedure that you're supposed to be following. All right, so there it is, guys. That's pretty much it. AWS D11 SMAW 3G test. Uh, so you'll notice the run-on tab. I mean, that kind of looks like an elephant defecating down the backside of a hill. Uh, but that's okay because that's going to get cut off. Same thing out in the field. You know, if I was using that, that's what that's there for. I'm going to go back in there. I'm going to flush cut that and then blend the material back into my weld. Okay, but I don't have any low spots at the entryway, and that's 
more or less what I'm looking for. Same thing with my runoff tab. You can see that this is flush all the way to the top or you know up to an eighth of an inch. So I don't have a big deep dish to go back in there and fill that out. Same thing if I was running this out in the field, take a cutoff wheel, cut that flush across the top. And then I've got solid weld, weld metal all the way on both sides. Um, other than that, I mean, uh, typically when I issue this test at school, I don't let the students use any power tools. So there's no grinders, whether it's a wire wheel or a hard rock, deburring tools, anything like that, uh, needle scalers, you know, anything pneumatic. Uh, everything's hand tools, you know, so chip and hammer, wire brush, maybe a pick set, a little bit of filing here and there if need be. But other than that, it's a, it's a weld test, it's not a grind test. So I want to grade the abilities of somebody's weld proficiencies, not you know how well they can cover something up or, or grind it back out. Um, but there are some codes you know that they're going to allow you for your interpass cleaning to use mechanical options. And if that option's there, go ahead and take advantage of it. But if not, you should know how to do this stuff with just your basic hand tools and the skills. Like I said, practice those starts and stops. That's uh, that's going to be a big ticket. You know, a lot of people freak out about that, but you should be comfortable doing starts and stops with any of your processes. Uh, so, so practice those just as much as you practice your regular welding skills. Uh, I think that's about it. So until next time, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you found it entertaining as well as educational. If you got any questions, go ahead and submit them in the comment section down below. Uh, and I'd be more than glad to help you out if I can in any way. Uh, thanks for watching. You know, without, without the viewers, you know, none of this will be happening here. And I appreciate you guys giving me the, uh, the time and opportunity to do this. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Give the video a like if you found it entertaining. And make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. So until next time, make every weld better than your last. Welcome back to another episode of HelpMeWeld.com. So today's submission is from Kenny Martinez. He used the Facebook group. Uh, so if you guys want to be featured in HelpMeWeld.com, go ahead and join our Facebook group. Post up in there. Ask questions. If you get comments, anything like that. Uh, go ahead and post up in there. You can also use hashtag helpmeweld.com on Instagram. So let's get to Kenny here. He's running a fill pass and needs some critique on a 3 16 outside corner joint. Using 1 16 filler on the root and 3 32nd at 95 amps on the fill. Feed me knowledge. Uh, well, Kenny, I would say your root looks great, man. Other than, I mean, you got a little bit of lack of fusion right in here where you probably eased off the pedal a little too soon at the termination. But the root pass looks good. So kind of follow the same principles that you did when you laid that root pass in there as far as your travel speed, work angle, and all that. Uh, it looks like on the exterior here where you're trying to put that cap pass in there, you're either A, not getting enough gas coverage, B, going too slow, which is causing an excessive amount of heat, or C, uh, using uh, a too small of a diameter for your filler wire. So I mean, on that outside corner joint, you could step up to an eighth inch uh, diameter filler metal. 70s6 i would recommend for the for the material you're welding on here and kind of increase your travel speed that may mean that you need to increase your heat on your foot pedal so maybe give it a little bit more foot pedal increase your travel speed turn your gas flow up a little bit um, i don't know if you're using a gas lens or a standard diffuser typically a gas lens is going to require a higher amount of cfh for your argon than a typical diffuser uh, you can bump those up. I've seen, you know, if you're using a, a gas lens, you can bump that up to almost 30 to 35 CFH and still be pretty decent. Standard call-up body, you're probably looking at about 20 CFH, which is, I think, right around where you said you were at. So, um, I mean, other than that, you know, just, just watch your puddle. Maybe increase your travel speed or increase your gas coverage. Um, but, I mean, if you can get it to look anything like that route, man, you're, you're home free. So guys, thanks for watching. We appreciate all the support you guys have been providing for us for the past couple of weeks, months, years. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. Make sure you like and subscribe uh, to the, the videos. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And until next time, make every well better than your last.